you have to say that he knows that he is a reward of a In the first case, you have to believe God is. Thank you. 
Second times is a faith of expectation or a faith in the willingness of God. You believe that God is willing. 
such as Matthew chapter 8, the first few verses. The leper came to Jesus wanting to know if he was willing to heal him, and Jesus said, I will, not I'm able. He knew that he was able or he never would have come to him to get his healing. But are you willing to heal me? I know you can do it or I wouldn't be here. And Jesus said, I'm willing. And that's his comment to every person who ever comes to him and asks. It's already been answered. That's why we don't have to pray. If it be thy will, we know what his will is now. The leper had to ask because he didn't know. But as a Christian, we should know it's his will. Will you heal me? I will. It's all there is to it. Will you cross for me? I will. So it's not just a faith in the ability of God. That's your conviction. It's a faith in the willingness of God. He's willing. It's an expectation involved in your faith. You're expecting God to do what you know that he's going to do. Psalm 62, verses 1 through 8. Now, there has to be some time element involved or it would all just happen immediately and you'd never have to seek God and wait for him to reward you. So Psalm 62 teaches that because your heart is settled and convinced and you're simply waiting expectantly until God manifests your prayer. Psalm 62. Only my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense, and I will not be greatly moved. How long will you imagine mischief against a man? You shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall shall you be in a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He's expecting God to do something for him. He knows that God is able, but now he's a step beyond that. He believes God's a rewarder of those who seek him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense, and I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people, and pour out your heart before him because God is a refuge for us. He believes that God is there and that he's going to do something about his circumstances as well. So what we said Wednesday night really fits in with what we're saying now. And, and you can add diligently in there. That's fine with me. It explains so you know how to seek God, that there's no other way to seek him but that way. That when you seek him that way, when you get up in the morning and seek him first, I know you're busy, but you pray first. When you seek him, he's going to reward that. There's no doubt about it. You, you can't get away from that. You may be tired. There may be 101 reasons why it's not the best time for you to do it, but he will reward you. You believe that God exists, so you're going to get up and we'll spend time studying the word, whether it's just a few moments or a few hours, I'm going to spend time with him first. You're seeking God now. You're seeking after him. When you come here, you're seeking to know more about him. There are so many ways that you prove that you're seeking after God. And some people are more diligent than others. Some people are going to be blessed more than others. That's what the Bible teaches. He's rewarded to a certain group of people, but we know some people get better rewards than other people. Some of those disciples got some blessings, but Peter... He was putting his foot in his mouth, but he was always seeking after Jesus, though. He got mixed up in his theology on several occasions. Oh, you could never go to the cross. Why, that's what the Old Testament taught, Isaiah 53. So Jesus had to rebuke him, said, Get thee behind me, Satan. You save us not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. But look what of those apostles gets lifted up. It's Peter, or it's John. He's always around Jesus, leaning on his breath. He's always around Jesus. Why don't we hear him? Some of these others like Thaddeus or something. Why is it that Jesus takes three, Peter, James, and John, on two or three occasions that were special to him? Transfiguration, raising of Jairus' daughter. He only takes Peter, James, and John, not the rest of them. Now, do you think God's unfair? I've used that example with people many times. Do you think God is unfair that he took Peter, James, and John? No, I think Peter, James, and John deserved it. 
That's all there is to it. God's not a respecter of persons. He's not going to lie. He's going to pick you three and you others. I'm not going to pick you. And I don't have any reason why I'm going to do that. That's just the way I'm going to do it. No, God doesn't do that. He's not a respecter of persons. Peter, James, and John got to go Mount of Transfiguration. Thaddeus didn't get to see that. Someone had to tell him about that. Peter says in 2 Peter 1, we were on the holy mountain and we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The rest of those guys didn't get to see it. And you know, you don't hear a whole lot, not as much, about them in the Gospels as Peter, James, and John. I wonder why. I'm telling you why. Some people are better speakers than others. They've made up their mind it's going to be like Job. We're going to seek after God. doesn't matter what happens. It's going to be like Joseph. We're going to stay faithful whether it's years in prison or centuries in prison. It was over a century for Noah, waiting, 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 waiting. But just in waiting, you're proving that you're seeking God. Because no one else is waiting for the uh, And those are wicked people are living in the So they're just fishing all so now he said, I've got to be the right one in all of this. I've got to be the right one. And he was. And he got rewarded because of that. What about Paul? Why was Paul even lifted up above Peter? He was in the New Testament church. Paul was a better seeker. You know, it's a mystery when you try to, well, how can that be? Why didn't you turn the button on or crank it up a little faster? I mean, what if God planned it that way, someone says, and then you can't do anything else about it? Well, you don't know whether he has or not. You won't know until we behold the end of that man. So you don't know now. I don't know now. So I'm just pretending like I'm one of those who's got it all the way turned up. Because, and anyone who raises questions like that proves they're one of the weaker ones right away. Well, maybe God's chosen me not to be a seeker, and so someone's going to be like Paul and I'll be like Peter. Well, why be satisfied with the, the lesser of those two? When from your side, as far as you know, and all of us have the possibility of going all the way. That's what I believe about myself. If I don't believe that, I'm going to give up right now then. Or I'm just going to hold steady for a while or slack off or get complacent or be comfortable or something. I've got to believe somehow. Somehow I can go all the way like other people have gone all the way. If you don't have a belief like that, you're not going to go all the way, that's for sure. Who are those places reserved for on his right and left hand? I think about that all the time. Somebody's going to get to get there. I wonder who that's going to be. Well, someone said, soon. Well, he's going to have to beat Paul because I think Paul is way up on my list anyway. <laughs> I'm sure he is on God's too. The apostle Paul, all that he went through, just living a perfect life before the Lord. Not Noah. Noah got drunk. Not Abraham. Abraham doubted God several times. Not David. He murdered someone and committed adultery. It's not any of those. Probably not Peter. <laughs> Paul had rebuked Peter. So who are those places reserved for? Or what about, I wouldn't mind being two seats over. <laughs> Not left and right, but left and right number two. Or three, that's all right with me. The third one would be fine with me. Someone's going to get there. I'm not trying to be too technical now explaining what that life will be like, what that room will be like, but... He gives us that comparison so we can understand what he's talking about, about a left and a right-hand seat. Well, the way, that's the way our mind thinks, a left and a right-hand seat. So there's got to be one on the left and right again, and left and right again, and left and right again. And which one are you going to be in? They're going to be way out at the end where you, he has to have a microphone to holler to you way out there. <laughs> you see him on the screen in the other room, you know. You're so far removed from him. <laughs> or is it going to be, you're going to be right there. Well, we know it's one thing to say, that's, that's me. It's another thing to prove it in our life. All of the diligence and the perfection and the obedience and the love and the depth required. Wow. But he's the rewarder of those who seek him. 
That's true in this world. You're rewarded. Most of the time it's true. We have an unfair world. Sometimes it doesn't work. Most of the time it's true. When you do good, you're rewarded. On your job, you're rewarded when you do good. A child, when you do good, you're rewarded. And it works perfectly. It doesn't work perfectly in this world. Some people who don't do good get rewarded anyway. That's not fair. And God never planned it that way. But in God's economy, it works perfectly. That you're rewarded on the basis of your obedience and your faith and your trust and love in Him. He's not just going to overrule someone who's been very, very faithful to the Lord, but God didn't predestinate that. He wanted to get someone else. He just didn't live up to what He wanted them to live up to. So He's going to give that other person the blessings when they never deserve them. So we're laboring this because it's something that you ought to spend a lot of time thinking on. If I'm not living my, you know, with my whole heart for God, then I'm not going to be rewarded like I could be. That's all there is to it. But I'm telling you this so you'll, you've got to have faith built in your heart from the promises of the Word of God. The promises are His invitations to you. And here's an invitation in Hebrews 11, 6c to serve Him more faithfully. It's an invitation. Because he promises your pay's going to increase. Your blessing's going to increase. If you'll seek me. Seek him in whatever way you can. I know all the ways I did and still do. And like I said, just coming here and being faithful to learn the word and desire to know the word. Then you're going to change as a result of that. But some people change more than others. We all know that. Some people change more than others. Because some people come really seeking God and some come partly seeking God. Some come in a right frame of mind, prepared, doing all they know they're supposed to do. And someone else, well, it's snowing out tonight. And I'm not saying you couldn't miss a service if it was snowing. I'm just saying many, 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 many times show something about the person. Maybe your car broke down and you can't get here. Well, that's okay. But I say this, what if there was a 10 foot blizzard, 100 mile an hour winds, but someone said, if you drive 17.2 miles, I'll give you $10 million. You think you'd get there? <laughs> you'd get there. You would be the dog in the dog sled team to get there. You'd tow your car behind you to get there. $10 million, you'd come. Well, what did we read? More to be desired than $10 million is this word. More to be desired is this word. And why is it overseas? You know, in this country, we're not like this, but overseas, you can set them out in 110 degree heat and preach the word to them, and they'll listen. Here, you've got to have the AC on or the heat on, whichever is right for that time of the year, or nobody comes. You know, can you imagine, can you imagine in your first dead Baptist church that if they didn't have the AC on in August in southern Louisiana, can you imagine those people fussing and foaming at the mouth? <laughs> They'd be as mad as a wet hen to come in church and it's hot in there and who do these people think we are? animals to come in here with all this heat and body odor and we've got to sit here and play church for a while it's because they're rebels at heart they don't love god you'd stand on your head and listen to the bible you'd swing from the church belfry to listen to the bible whatever you had to do we've given you these illustrations before remember mark 2 you couldn't get in the house you'd tear the roof apart to get in there I've always thought that was remarkable that someone had that type of seeking after God in their heart. Tore up a perfectly good room. you got to repair that. Somebody's in trouble. You see, all we're given is a neat account. And what happens when reality sets in after the ministry moves on? <laughs> that fellow's still got a hole in his roof, though. <laughs> I think about those things, you know, because I know what it's like. Whenever the blessing is there, who cares about a hole in the roof? But tomorrow... <laughs> or everyone taking their glasses off and smashing them we've all got our healing we'll wait 120 years to get it until tomorrow yeah. <laughs> you wake up tomorrow and you think boy I was so foolish to do that I wasted $75 on that cheap pair of glasses of mine I gotta go buy another pair so foolish to do or go fish them back out of the lake where you threw them in or something <laughs> I don't even account where that really happened 
where someone didn't do it, it was done accidentally. Someone threw their glasses out in the middle of a lake and someone accidentally fished them out and there were the glasses that had your address on it. And they mailed it to them. And here's someone trying to believe for their healing of their eyes. And the devil sends you your glasses back in the mail. You think you'd never see those things again. You threw them out in the middle of a lake and someone actually fished them out of there. It was an accident, you know, going for a long salmon and caught your glasses down at the bottom. <laughs> and mail them to you. And, you know, the Christian would think, well, this must be the Lord telling me to put them back on. So supernatural that someone caught it. <laughs> Call my glasses must be the Lord. Oh, well, you could see the devil grinning in your mailbox that morning. <laughs> you have to smash those things. <laughs> Smash those things in a hurry. Well, I'm just trying to encourage all our faith. What if you don't see any better for 120 years? That is a possibility. Certainly is. And you have to be of the faith where you say, I don't care. It does not matter to me. I'll be gone in 70 years anyway. <laughs> Won't need my eyesight after that anyway. So it's just a temporal inconvenience is all that it is. Same with any healing or anything. Same with your prosperity. You never get prosperous. Well, that's just a temporal inconvenience that you have to live like a pauper for 70 years. One day, assuming you get into the kingdom, one day you won't be a pauper anymore. We're not saying wait until you die, but I'm saying you just believe God regardless of what the time element is that's involved, regardless of that. But, you know, we've got a promise. You know, I'm making it sound extreme. We've got a promise that he's a rewarder. <laughs> He didn't say that you'll die without getting it. He said that he's a rewarder. You will get it before you die. No doubt about that. If you believe him, you'll get it before you die. He is a rewarder. But it's a great encouragement to our faith to know what God will do if we just simply trust him. That's all there is to it. Just simply trust him. And express it in our life, what we do. Like these men being so foolish to break up that house. But that man got his healing then, though. Those were seekers. Amen. The woman who got close enough to him to touch his garment. She was a seeker. The Syrophoenician woman who received no was a seeker. She kept saying, I'm coming back for more. I'm coming back for more. And finally, Jesus said, okay, yes. Great is thy faith, O woman. And let it be to your daughter, let it be unto her according to what you have believed. It's according to your faith. But how many of us would have turned away the first time that all of his apostles jumped on our case? Said, now don't bother him. Scat, get away. <laughs> and you come to him and he said, I'm not sent <clears throat> to you dogs. I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you know how that would offend people? Religious people today, if we call them religious swine. That offends people. You calling me a sow? That's exactly what I'm calling you. Peter does over in 2 Peter 2. Yeah. You're like a sow wallowing in the mud and the dog returns to its own vomit whenever you give up the faith. That offends people. This woman said, well, I'll be a sow. I'll be an orangutan, whatever you want me to be. You can call me whatever you want to, but I won't take a no. I won't take a no for an answer. But some people, you just offend them. If you, if you use them one time as a sermon illustration, it makes them so mad. <laughs> well, you know what I'm talking about. We're just being honest with you this morning. Makes them mad. He, I know who he's talking about. He's talking about me. That's right, I am. So what? You know, like, with a response like that, you are not. Can't you see? If I did that, if you did, you're not like that Syrophoenician woman. She said, you can call me whatever you want to. But I'm going to keep pressing in. Of course, she didn't make a mistake like maybe you did. That's why we're using you as a sermon illustration. I've used myself before. I don't care. I don't care what I look like in the eyes of people. If I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake. That's all there is to it. And the sooner I find that out, the better, as far as I'm concerned. But I'm not going to sit out there and cuss and froth at the mouth like some people would. People can tell he's using me as a sermon illustration. Let us find well, Jesus called Peter the devil one time. That's Matthew 16. Looked right at Peter and said, Get thee hence, Satan. That must have offended Peter. 
Maybe not. Well, I'm saying it could have. It probably didn't. Peter just loved his Lord enough anyway. He said, well, even if I am the devil, I don't have, you're the one to get the truth from. I certainly wouldn't be the one if I'm the devil. And what about all those people over in John 6? From that saying, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They said, that's a hard saying. You've offended all of us. You've hurt our religious feelings. Jesus said, the sooner the better for you guys then. Because you're wasting your time, you're wasting my time to keep on going on a road that you're not even on. The sooner the better. Offended people's religious feelings. You gotta go beyond worrying about offending someone's religious notions in their mind. I pull the stoppers out in the last couple of weeks in some of my conversations with people just to tell them like it is. So I don't owe you anything except the truth. I owe you the truth, and love is what compels me to tell you the truth. I'm not going to bow before someone's religious misconceptions and let them go along their way, and you let me go along my way, we'll both be okay. No, we won't. Either one of us is not okay. So you just have to tell it to them like it is. Well, you see, if someone tells it to you like it is, it's probably just to get you back on the right track so you can be a seeker so that you can get rewarded. So what's wrong with that? Amen. That's just what you're aiming after anyway. Right. It is to get on that straight and narrow way and not get, get off of it because you know that in being on that, God's going to reward you. He's a rewarder of those that seek after him, right. that trust him and that seek after him. So I think I'll conclude with some verses over in Proverbs chapter 3. Verses 5 and 6. Our second, our second responsibility to God is to trust Him in all things. First, to love Him. Secondly, to trust Him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. It's promises to those who are seeking after the Lord again. Oh, he just goes on. There's so many promises right here in this chapter. Verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. And he'll reward you. Thy barns will be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. You seek wisdom as he goes on in verse 13. You seek wisdom, verse 16. The length of days he will give you as well as riches and honor. And all your life, verse 17, will be pleasant and your ways will be peace. Thank you, Lord. Promise after promise. And if you diligently seek him, he'll diligently reward you.